Thank you so much. Uh, hello, everyone, and thanks to the organizers for the opportunity to join this discussion. So for my brief presentation today, I will be sharing a set of reflections on our recent work, um, which is more broadly in the area of digital cultures and access to knowledge, with a focus on multilinguality on the internet. And what I hope to do is to try and bring back some observations and learnings from these spaces for us to discuss collectively as DH observers, researchers, and practitioners. Uh, now, the discourse around DH as a discipline, as a field, um, is, is still growing in the Indian context and have several intersections with work in education, computing, um, cultural heritage, archival practice, etc. To, to name a few areas. And there has also been a substantive body of critique on um, an Anglo-centric form of DH, reflected in concerns um, of a lack of diversity and multilinguality in the field, as addressed by work in post-colonial and feminist DH, um, the development of collectives such as South Asian uh, DH, Global Outlook DH, Multilingual DH, et cetera. So efforts within DH to address linguistic barriers in particular have been key. Um, especially in countries in the global south. Um, such efforts, however, are also shaped by larger persistent infrastructural and access related challenges of the internet. So as Paolo Ricard uh, notes in a paper on data epistemologies, multi-ethnic um, countries with high levels of social inequality are at greater risk of double or triple marginalization through digital technologies and dominant data epistemologies. For this reason, studies of data and digital colonialism should take into account the process of colonization that reproduces injustice within and across countries and enacts violence on gendered and racialized bodies, exacerbates class divisions, damages our relationship with nature, excludes expressions of diversity and traditional languages, and erases alternate visions of the world so that technology can continue to operate as a renewed form of oppression. So we see these infrastructural challenges or gaps in the Indian context uh, in many spaces, you know, and then my presentation was, I think, a great way to sort of get into that discussion, setting that context. Um, most notably, you know, in, in the form of digital divides, uh, which precede even the development of DH itself. So, for example, in policy reforms related to the use of digital technologies in education, uh, or more recently in terms of challenges with remote working, teaching and learning, to even looking outside the university context at platformization of gig work, um, mass public vaccination programs, you know, in the wake of the pandemic, all mediated through digital technologies. So even as basic issues with access and infrastructure persist, there is an urgency in terms of large scale adoption of digital technologies over the last few years, um, further urged by policy reforms. So there are still significant infrastructural limitations to digital humanities work in India, being as it is a resource heavy discipline in the ways it has been traditionally imagined. Um, so uh, Shanmuga Priya and uh, Nirmala Menon, and that's again, uh, people that Maya briefly spoke about, in their work on situated practices in DH in India, reiterate how the lack of specific forms of infrastructure, such as digital humanities labs, pedagogy, tools, and software, and institutional and government support has impeded Indian humanities scholars from leveraging the affordances of computational techniques and resources. They further emphasize the specific deficit of such technologies in the realm of Indian languages, and importantly, as exacerbated by the divide between humanities and computer sciences. The recently concluded uh, conference by the Digital Humanities Alliance for Research and Teaching in India also highlighted some of these aspects in terms of a decolonial framing of DH work, but also the need for more localized DH work where multilinguality becomes an important signifier of diversity, access, and infrastructure. And we see these conversations emerging slowly in many spaces, uh, notably in publishing and pedagogy, content production, Indic language computing, et cetera, to name a few. As mentioned earlier, these are challenges that have predated DH and they continue to exist in the ways in which we imagine and conceptualize digital infrastructures today. So I'll move on to the projects that I want to talk about. The first is a recently published report on the state of the internet's languages um, and work on this was led by Who's Knowledge in collaboration with the Oxford Internet Institute and uh, the Center for Internet and Society and over a hundred people across the world. 
The report brings together data and stories on how people read, write, speak online in multiple languages. Working with the premise that language is a proxy for knowledge, the report looks at how most human knowledge, especially those produced in non-dominant and marginalized languages, continues to remain underrepresented on the web. The data visualizations and narratives were led by OI, and the stories were curated through an open call anchored by us at CIS. So this is just a brief snapshot of the stories to give you a sense of the thematic areas that intersect with the broader theme of language, um, that of identity, marginalization, accessibility, multilingual pedagogy, and mobility, uh, among many, many other themes. The second project um, is a series of collaborative and exploratory short-term research projects on Wikimedia platforms and communities in India. And this was undertaken by team members of the Access to Knowledge program at CIS. Um, the projects are, again, on a range of topics from systemic issues such as the gender gap and bias in Indian language Wikimedia projects um, to access and reuse of cultural content across different languages, challenges with open access multilingual pedagogy to experiences of content creation in Indian languages on diverse Wikimedia projects. We also have um, ongoing studies now on Wikisource on uh, mapping open access content related to gender and sexuality and, and a project looking at water resources and uh, information on water resources in Indian languages. So quickly to move on to learnings and observations from these projects. So both the above initiatives highlight several asymmetries in the development and access to content and digital infrastructures for languages other than English, as well as efforts being undertaken by diverse communities to address them. These are some key thematic areas of our learnings and observations. So the first is decolonizing and, and what, we, what we are really sort of understanding in terms of decolonizing. One of the key attempts of the um, State of the Internet Languages report is an effort to unpack precisely what is meant by decolonization itself and how we approach it from different contexts. As illustrated by many of the stories in the report, the, the inherent complexities of the discourse is also, uh, also urge a reflection of our own locations in this uh, post-colonial, decolonial context, say in the global south, and, um, and a reflection then on colonial, post-colonial, dominant languages, marginalized, endangered, disappearing languages, etc. So connected, connected to this point is the you know, is that language inequity is located within and for, further perpetuates various asymmetries of power, which then disproportionately affect marginalized non-dominant communities. And these are various asymmetries, for example, the lack of effective translation and availability of content on gender and sexuality and accessibility, which then opens up space for issues like hate speech, misinformation, gender and gender-based violence online. Um, the connected point then is digital infrastructure. So how does language offer a critical perspective to understand infrastructure conceptually and politically? How adaptable is web infrastructure and programming languages um, across multiple languages? The development of keyboards and fonts through NLP, for example, um, uh, sorry, keyboards and fonts in various languages, number of languages that are easily available on your smartphone through NLP. Uh, many Indic languages not being fully Unicode compliant. So there's like a series of, of issues and concerns. Finally, the point on multimodality. So the stories in the STL report present very embodied experiential narratives of language, whether through speech, signs, emojis, or text, right? And the significance of orality, of image, signs, etc., is emphasized across these stories to question the primacy of the textual on the internet. Moving on to, again, content creation, there is a lack of efficient content management systems in non-dominant languages, in part due to technical barriers in the process of identifying and sourcing content, translation, digitization, and archiving. Uh, capacity building is an additional challenge, so this prevalent digital divide due to linguistic barriers um, is further aggravated by a lack of sufficient digital or technological literacy in using tools, as well as knowledge of legal and infrastructural aspects. A related issue is that of ownership, access, and regulation. Um, so the need for a more nuanced approach to how we understand open access at different levels and across contexts. So can we think of a wider sort of conceptual vocabulary drawing from these diverse embodied experiences of the internet to frame how we think of access? Finally, the overarching problem um, when we look at infrastructure gaps is that of ownership and regulation. 
So policy reforms encouraging development of technological support for low non-literate communities and non-dominant and marginalized languages are the need of the hour. Final slide. So what do we take away from this for digital humanities? Um, really, how do we unpack infrastructure and access as conceptual and political terms then that shape our engagement with internet, with the internet and digital technologies? What are community-led forms of research and practice which center multilinguality, um, which center the voices of those affected most by uneven distribution of infrastructure? And uh, how by creative critical forms of digital literacy and multilingual pedagogy and uh, eventually what are new questions or forms of question making that they enable for uh, the humanities itself right so yeah i think these are my learnings from the two projects yeah i'll, I'll just conclude yeah. thank you so much <laughs>